wife wouldn't guess the ending of the tale, that he wagered her a shilling that she couldn't name the murderer. With this story, Conan Doyle enters the rarefied world of professional horse racing, a world full of its own rules. He was taken to task by several sports writers for transgressing a few of those. Responding to these critics, Conan Doyle said the following, Sometimes I have got upon dangerous ground where I have taken risks through my own want of knowledge of the correct atmosphere. I have, for example, never been a racing man, and yet I ventured to write Silver Blaze, in which the mystery depends upon the laws of training and racing. The story is all right, and Holmes may have been at the top of his form, but my ignorance cries aloud to heaven. I read an excellent and very damaging criticism of the story in some sporting paper, written clearly by a man who did know, in which he explained the exact penalties which would come upon everyone concerned if they acted as I described. Half would have been in jail, and the other half warned off the turf forever. However, I have never been nervous about details, and one must be masterful sometimes. Arthur Conan Doyle, writing about his Sherlock Holmes story, Silver Blaze. Here's episode one of this new dramatization with Edward Pepperbridge as the great detective. Home. I'm afraid, Watson, that I shall have to go. Go? Where to? To Dartmoor, to King's Island. Ah. I should be most happy to go down with you, Holmes, if I should not be in the way. My dear Watson, you'd confer a great favor upon me by coming. I was not surprised. Indeed, my only wonder was that Holmes was not already mixed up in the extraordinary case, which was the one topic of conversation, the length and breadth of England the singular disappearance of the favourite for the Wessex Cup, the famous stallion Silver Blaze, and the tragic murder of its trainer. We have, I think, just time to catch our train at Paddington. You will oblige me by bringing your excellent field glasses? Of course. On Tuesday evening, I received telegrams, both from Colonel Ross, the owner of the horse, and from Inspector Gregory. Tuesday evening? And this is Thursday morning. Why did you not go down yesterday? Because I made a blunder, my dear Watson. Which is, I am afraid, a more common occurrence. Who only knew me through your memory? <laughs> and the fact is, that I could not believe it possible that the most remarkable horse in England could remain long concealed, especially in so sparsely inhabited a place as the north of Dartmoor. From hour to hour, yesterday, I expected to hear that he had been found, and that his abductor was the murderer of John Straker. When another morning came and nothing had been done, I felt it was time for me to take action. I see. Oh, let me give you the essential facts, for nothing appears in the case so much as stating it to another person. Silver Blaze holds a brilliant record. He has won all the important prizes of the turf for his fortunate owner. No, Colonel Ross. Indeed. Up to the time of his disappearance, Silver Blaze was the favourite for the Wessex Cup, with the betting being three to one on. Even at these short odds, enormous sums of money have been laid on him. It is obvious that there were many people who had the strongest interest in preventing Silver Blaze from being there at the fall of the flag next Tuesday. This fact was, of course, appreciated at the Colonel's training stable. Every precaution was taken to guard the paper. John Straker, the uh, trainer, who was himself a retired jockey, had always shown himself to be a zealous and honest servant. He ensured that at least one stable lad remained alert throughout the night. Now, the country roundabout is very lonely. The nearest property is, in fact, another stable, owned by Lord Backwater, a competitor, and is managed by one Silas Brown. In every other direction, the moor is a complete wilderness, inhabited only by a few gypsies. Now, on the evening of the catastrophe, the horses had been exercised and watered as usual, and the stables were locked up at nine o'clock. One of the stable lads, Ned Hunter, remained on guard. A few minutes after nine, the maid crossed the courtyard to bring him a supper of curried mutton. His only drink was water. She was about 30 yards from the stables when a man stepped out of the darkness. Oh, can you tell me where I am? I'd almost made up my mind to sleep on the moor when I saw the light of your lantern. You're close to the King's Pile and Training Stables. Oh, indeed. What a stroke of luck. I understand that a stable boy sleeps there alone every night. Perhaps that's his supper you're carrying. 
Now, I'm sure that you would not be too proud to earn the price of a new dress, would you? Uh, here, um, if, if you give this note to the boy, you shall have the prettiest frock that money can buy. Mm -hmm. Sir, I, I'm uh, sure I cannot take your money or your offers. I'm in no harm. Come back. Oh, blast. Ned, Ned, there's a man outside offering money to speak with you. What's he look like? He's a gent in a grey suit and gaiters. He's got a big stick, Ned. Right. You stay here. Ah, oh, uh, good evening. Hey. He's at the window, Ned. Hello. I just wanted to have a word with you. I hope you don't mind me calling so late. I was hoping the young lady here might have effected an introduction. What business have you here? It's business that may put something in your pocket. You two horses in for the Wessex Cup, Silver Blaze and Bayard. Let me have the straight tip and you won't be the loser. So you're one of those damn touts. I'll come out there and show you how we serve them in King's Island. Steady on. Ned sprang up and rushed across the stable to unloose the dog. The girl fled back to the house, but as she ran, she looked back and saw that the stranger was still leaning against the window. A minute later, however, when Ned rushed out with the hound, the man was gone, and though Ned ran all round the buildings, he failed to find any trace of him. Moment. Did the stable lad, when he ran out with the dog, leave the door unlocked behind him? Excellent, Watson, excellent. The importance of the point struck me so forcibly that I sent a special wire to Dartmoor yesterday to clear the matter up. The boy locked the door before he left it. And the window, I may add, was not large enough for a man to get through. Now, Watson, what followed? Ned sends a message to the trainer, Mr. Straker. He becomes very agitated and leaves his bed and Mrs. Straker, despite her entreaties, for it was a very wet night, and insists on visiting the stables. In the morning, Mrs. Straker awoke at seven o'clock to find that her husband had not yet returned. She immediately set off for the stables. She found the door open, Ned in an absolute stupor, and both Silver Blaze and her husband vanished. They hoped, of course, that the trainer had gone for an early morning gallop on the prized animal. But, on ascending a knoll from which all the neighboring moors were visible, they could not only see no sign of the favorite, but they perceived something which warned them they were in the presence of a tragedy. In the distance, they could see John Straker's overcoat flapping from a furze bush. They raced over to the bush and found, in a bowl-shaped depression in the moor, the dead body of the unfortunate trainer. His head had been shattered by a savage blow from some heavy weapon, and he was wounded in the thigh, where there was a long, clean cut. It was clear, however, that Straker had defended himself vigorously against his assailant. But in his right hand, he held a small knife, which was clotted with blood up to the handle. In his left, he grasped a red and black silk cravat, which was recognized by the maid as having been worn on the previous evening by the stranger who had visited the stable. But where was the horse? I have no idea. Neither do I. But all in good time, Watson, all in good time. There were abundant proofs in the mud which lay at the bottom of the fatal hollow uh, that Silver Blaze had been there at the time of the struggle. Yet, from that morning, no sign of the favorite has been seen. All the gypsies of Dartmoor are on the alert, but as yet we have no news. The only other fact that we should note is the contents of the stable lad's supper. It contained an appreciable quantity of opium. This accounts, of course, for his stupor. But, and this is interesting, Watson, while the people of the house all partook of the same dish on the same night, not one of them showed any ill effects. Now, what of the police and their efforts? Inspector Gregory is on the case, a competent officer, but not graced with the gift of imagination. On arrival, he immediately arrested the stranger who arrived in the night, one Fitzroy Simpson. Mr. Simpson is a man of excellent birth and education who squandered his fortune upon the turf and now lives by doing a little quiet and genteel bookmaking. He declared that he had no sinister designs but simply wished to obtain first-hand information. When confronted by his cravat, he turned very pale and was utterly unable to account for its presence in the hands of the murdered man. His wet clothing showed that he had been out in the storm the night before and his stick his stick watson which was a penang lawyer weighted with lead was just such a weapon as might by repeated blows have smashed the skull of the benighted horse but and this but must weigh in our deliberations fitzroy simpson did not have a mark on him nothing 
And since we know from Straker's knife that at least one of his assailants must be wounded, this presents us with an additional mystery. So, there you have it, all in a nutshell, Watson. And if you can shed any light, I shall be infinitely obliged to you. Is it not possible that the incised wound upon Straker may have been caused by his own knife in the convulsive struggles which follow any brain injury? It is more than possible. It is probable. In that case, one of the main points in favor of the accused disappears. And yet, even now, I fail to understand what the theory of the police can be. I'm afraid that whatever theory we state has very grave objections to it. The police imagine, I take it, that this Fitzroy Simpson, having drugged the lad and having in some way obtained a duplicate key, opened the stable door, kidnapped the horse, and was making good his escape when the trainer overtook them. A row naturally ensued, and Simpson beat out the trainer's brains with his heavy stick without receiving any injury from Straker's knife. Hmm. Simpson then led the horse to some secret hiding place, or it may have bolted during the struggle. That is the case as it appears to the police, and improbable as it is, all other explanations are more improbable still. I shall very quickly test the matter once I am on the spot. Until then, all further speculation is um, utterly futile. Mm. It was evening before we reached the little town of Tavistock, which lies like the boss of a shield in the middle of the huge circle of Dartmoor. Two gentlemen were awaiting us at the station. The one, a tall, fair man with lion-like hair and beard and curiously penetrating eyes. The other, a small, alert person, very neat and dapper, in a frock coat and gaiters, with trim little side whiskers and an eyeglass. The latter was Colonel Ross, the well-known sportsman. The other, Inspector Gregory, a man who was rapidly making his name in the English detective service. I'm delighted that you've come down, Mr. Holmes. The inspector here has done all that could possibly be suggested, but uh, I wish to leave no stone unturned in trying to avenge poor Straker and in recovering my horse. Have there been any fresh developments? I'm sorry to say that we've made very little progress. We have a carriage waiting. I'll give you the details as we go. The net is drawn pretty close around Fitzroy Simpson, and I believe that he is our man. At the same time, I recognize that the evidence is purely circumstantial, and that some new development may upset it. How about Straker's knife? We have come quite to the conclusion that he wounded himself in the fall. My friend Dr. Watson here made that suggestion to me as we came down. Mm -hmm. If so, it would tell against this man, Simpson. Undoubtedly. He has neither a knife nor any sign of a wound. The evidence against him is certainly very strong. He had a great interest in the disappearance of the favourite. He lies under suspicion of having poisoned the stable boy. He was undoubtedly out in the storm. He was armed with a heavy stick and his cravat was found in the dead man's hand. I really think we have enough to go before a jury. A clever counsel will tear it all to rags. Why should he take the horse out of the stable? If you wish to injure it, why could he not do it there? Has a duplicate key been found in his possession? What chemist sold him the powdered opium? Above all... Where could he, a stranger to the district, hide a horse? And such a horse as this. What is his explanation as to the paper which he wished the maid to give the stable boy? Well, he says it was a ten-pound note. One was found in his purse. Your other difficulties are not so formidable as they seem. He has twice lodged at Tavistock in the summer. The opium was probably brought from London. The key, having served its purpose, will be hurled away. The horse may lie at the bottom of one of the old mines upon the moor. Oh, I certainly hope not. What does he say about the cravat? Well, he acknowledges that it is his and declares that he lost it. But a new element has been introduced into the... <laughs> we have found traces which show that a party of gypsies encamped on Monday night within a mile of the spot where the murder took place. On Tuesday, they were gone. Now, presuming that there was some understanding between Simpson and these gypsies... Might not he have been leading the horse to them when he was overtaken, and may they not have him now? It is certainly possible. The moor is being scoured for these gypsies. I've also examined every stable and outhouse in Tavistock, and for a radius of ten miles. There is another training stable, quite close, I understand. Yes, the Capleton stable. They could certainly prove important. 
Pharaoh's desperate, it was second favourite, and so they did have an interest in the disappearance of Silver Blaze. Silas Brown, the trainer, is known to have had large bets upon the event, and he was no friend to Paul Straker. Now, we have, of course, examined the stables, and there is nothing to connect him with the affair. And nothing to connect this man, Simpson, with the interests of the Capleton stable? Nothing at all. Holmes leaned back in the carriage, and the conversation ceased. A few minutes later, our driver pulled up at a neat little red brick villa with overhanging eaves which stood by the road. In every direction, the low curves of the moor, bronze-coloured from the fading ferns, stretched away to the skyline, broken only by the steeples of Tavistock and by a cluster of houses away to the westward which marked the Capleton stables. We all sprang out with the exception of Holmes, who continued to lean back with his eyes fixed upon the sky in front of him, entirely absorbed in his own thoughts. It was only when I touched his arm that he roused himself. No. I was daydreaming. Perhaps you would prefer to go at once to the scene of the crime, Mr. Holmes. I think that I should prefer to stay here a little and go into one or two questions of detail. Straker was brought back here, I presume. Yes, he lies upstairs. The inquest is tomorrow. He has been in your service some years, Colonel Ross. Yeah, I've always found him an excellent servant. I presume that you made an inventory of what he had in his pockets at the time of his death, Inspector. I had the things themselves in the sitting room, if you would care to see them. I shall be very glad. It's all in this box, gentlemen. Nothing out of the ordinary, as you can see. A box of matches, tallow candle, pipe, sealed skin tobacco pouch, silver watch and chain, and some papers, five gold sovereigns, aluminium pencil case, and an ivory-handled blade. I see. I would like to take a closer look at the knife, if I may. And take care, Mr. Holmes. It's razor sharp. Mm, I see. And the blade is entirely inflexible. And there is an inscription. It is marked Weiss and Company. Mm. This is a very singular knife. I presume, as I see blood stains upon it, that it is the one which was found in the dead man's craft. That is correct, sir. Watson, this knife is surely in your line. Here, take a look. Oh, yes. Oh. Oh. It is what we call a cataract knife. Cataract knife? Yeah. A very delicate blade devised a very delicate work. A strange thing for a man to carry with him upon a rough expedition, especially as it would not shut in his pocket. The tip was guarded by a disc of cork which we found beside his body. Now, his wife tells us that the knife had lain for some days upon the dressing table and that he had picked it up as he left the room. It was a poor weapon, but perhaps the best he could lay his hand on in the moment. Very possible. Now, how about these papers? Well, three of them are hay dealer's receipts. And one of them is a letter from Colonel Ross. Now, this other is a milliner's account for £37.15, made out by Madame Legurier of Bond Street to William Derbyshire. Now, Mrs. Straker tells us that Derbyshire was a friend of her husband's and that occasionally his letters were addressed here. Madame Derbyshire had somewhat expensive tastes. Twenty-two guineas is rather heavy for a single costume. Oh, well... There appears to be nothing more to learn, and so we may as well go down to the scene of the crime. Have you got them? Have you found them? No, Mrs. Straker, but Mr. Holmes here has come all the way from London to help us, and we shall do all that is possible. Indeed, we shall, Inspector. Mrs. Straker, how strange. I feel certain we've met before. Uh, surely I met you in Plymouth at a garden party some time ago. No, sir. You must be mistaken. Uh, Demi, why, I could have sworn it. You wore a delightful costume of dark coloured silk with the ostrich feather trimming. I never had such a dress, sir. Ah, that quite settles it. I must apologise. My memory is clearly playing me tricks. <laughs> well, Inspector, I think it is time for our expedition. Yes, Mr. Holmes. The body was found I by... I think you may spare us the details. Of... Yeah, Inspector, just take us to the place. Oh, yes, of course. Well, if you'd like to follow me, gentlemen, if you will excuse us, Mrs. Straker. Yeah. As desolate a spot as one might wish for a murder. Eh, Watson? Indeed. This hollow would ensure concealment from any prying eyes. Quiet. And this bush is where you found the coat of the deceased? That's correct. There was no wind that night, I understand. None, but there was a very heavy rain. Torrential rain, sir. Never seen the light. In that case, General, the overcoat was not blown against the first last place. Yes, sir. It was laid across the bush. You fill me with interest. I perceive that the ground has been trampled up a good deal. 
No doubt many feet have been here since Monday night. Yes, Mr. Holmes. The ground has not been disturbed. I took the precaution of laying a piece of matting. We all stood upon that. Excellent. And in this bag, I have one of the boots which strike a wall. One of Fitzroy Simpson's shoes and a cast-off horseshoe belonging to Silver Blaze. Yes, better you surpass yourself. If you'll be so good as to give me this vital bag, I will be back in a few moments. What's he up to, Dr. Watson? Conducting a close examination. He's got his nose so close to the mud, he looks like a bloodhound. What's he about? Smelling out clues? And that could be about the size of it, Inspector. Well, I doubt you'll find much. Ah, what's this? What have you found? It's a match, Watson. Half burned and covered in mud. Oh, I cannot think how I came to overlook it. Well, I hope there are no other things you've overlooked, sir. Uh, do not be disconsolate, Inspector. This little match was invisible, buried in the mud. I only saw it because I was looking for it. What? You expected to find it? I thought it was not unlikely. Are we done here, sir? It's damnably cold. I shall not be long. Huh? I must take just a little look about the rim of this hollow. Well, I'm afraid that there are no more tracks. I've examined the ground very carefully for a hundred yards in each direction. Indeed. I should not have the impertinence to do it again after what you say. But I should like to take a little walk over the moors before it gets dark, that I may know my ground tomorrow. And I think I shall put this horseshoe into my pocket. For luck. <laughs> so it's luck we shall depend upon now. Inspector, I was hoping for a little more illumination by this time. I think we've had quite enough foraging for trifles. Mr. Holmes has his own method, sir, and he's barely begun his investigation. Very well. Now, Inspector, there are several points on which I should like your advice, and especially as to whether we do not owe it to the public to remove our horse's name from the entrance to the cup. Uh, certainly not. I should let the name stand. I'm very glad to have your opinion, sir. Well, you'll find us at poor Straker's house when you've finished with your walk, and we can drive together to Tavistock. Next time on the conclusion of Silver Blaze, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson discover a set of horse tracks that may crack the case wide open. Ah, you see? You see, hoop fits. Now, let us see if my lucky horseshoe fits. Yeah. Oh, now, you see the value of imagination. It is the one quality which we to relax. We imagine what might have happened, acted upon the supposition, and find ourselves justified. Let us proceed. Holmes puts the pieces together and finds he needs just one to complete the picture. He plays a hunch to find it. I see you have a few sheep in your paddock. How remarkably observant. Lieutenant, one of the stable lads. You want a word? Indeed, I do. Barnes, over here. Yes, sir. Mr. Holmes here would like to ask you a few questions. Good afternoon, Barnes. I want to ask you about your sheep. Have you noticed anything amiss with them of late? Well, sir, not a much account. But three of them have gone lame, sir. <laughs> Gregory, let me recommend to your attention this singular epidemic among the sheep. Oh, and one other thing. Note the curious incident of the dog in the night time. The dog did nothing in the night time. That was the curious incident. Good night, gentlemen. We shall look forward to seeing you again at the races. At the end of the tale, he presents Colonel Ross with Silver Blaze and the murderer. You've done me a great service by recovering my horse. You'd do me a greater service still if you could lay your hands on the murderer of John Straight. I have done so. He is here. Here? Where? In my company at the present moment. Well, I quite recognize that I'm under obligations to you, Mr. Holmes, but I must regard what you've just said as either a very bad joke or an insult. I assure you that I have not associated you with the crime, Colonel. The real murder is standing immediately beside you. That's next time on the final episode of Arthur Conan Doyle's Silver Blaze.
Adapted for radio by Tim Crook and Richard Shannon. Support for this program comes from National Public Radio member stations and NPR, whose contributors include LexisNexis, helping legal, business, and government professionals collect, manage, and use information. And the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund, helping people to make the arts part of their everyday lives. I'm Steve Zakar. This is NPR National Public Radio.